Welcome. Welcome to Promise Fellowship. I'm just going to check really quick. See if we're on here. Actually, Trish, can you check it? Do you mind sure. doing that? Okay. I was going to pray. Lord God, thank you for meeting us here. God, we thank you that you are here. God, we've come to give you worship. We've come to give you praise. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for meeting us right where we are. God, we might be tired, but the joy of you is our strength. The joy of you is our strength. And Lord, as we seek you, we're going to find you. As we ask for your um, leading, you will lead. As we ask for wisdom, you're going to show us. You'll show us whatever it is that we're needing. Thank you, God. Thank you for being here. God, may your word go forth with power. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yep. We're going to sing here for you. So if you guys want to stand, you're welcome to stand. If you want to sit, if you want to come to the altar, you can do that. So here we go. Let our praise be a welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Breath. Let your breath come from heaven, fill our hearts with your light. We are here for you. We are here for you. To your hearts. To your hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are one desire. You are good amen amen Amen. okay i'm gonna do things just a little tad different today so i'm gonna do prayer requests offering trisha and mike has something and then trisha's gonna teach then i'll teach okay we'll worship between there We'll let the Lord flow. So does anybody have a prayer request at all? 
Anything? Any needs? Any? Any thank yous, Mom? People with COVID and other things too. There's so much going around: colds and COVID plus other illnesses. Anything over here? I know that we all prophesy in part, and there's there's the real prophetic and there's the false prophetic. But you know, just the the prophetic flow. It just seems like they're just giving everybody a heads up, warning of things to come. Everybody's kind of. No one really knows the time when it comes to the prophetic words being fulfilled, but everybody's kind of getting the same warnings. And so just that God would, I know he's strategic, but that we would really hear him and, and, and desire to hear for instructions as well as um, wisdom. I'm asking for wisdom. Are you going to elaborate on that a little bit when you talk? Sure. Okay. So I have two things. Just a second. You can just come say for just a Thank you, Josh. So there's a gentleman that came to our service, oh, I don't know, a month and a half or two ago, Salvador. He was driving by when I was putting the sign out, and his wife, who passed away six years ago, her name is Laura. Um, her birthday is on Tuesday. So let's just pray for Salvador, just for his own heart. Um, and then also... A thank you to the Lord, because remember last week, we prayed that God would send laborers to the daycare, and here too, we're <laughs> desiring that as well. He had um, somebody call. No, they came in. Actually, somebody texted me, and then that person came in. They were there at like 7.31 that morning. They saw me going in. Anyways, um, so she's coming back, and then we had somebody else call. And then my mom talked to somebody else Saturday. So we've got maybe, maybe three laborers coming to God's ministry at Promise Daycare. Um, so that's a thank you. All right, I'm just going to pray. Lord, we pray just as we've made our petitions know, God, uh, for the people who are sick, COVID, other sicknesses, cancer, God, we lift up Carlene to you, God, you know, or Charlene, Charlene. God, you know what she needs. And Lord, I just pray that you would just eradicate every cell that's not healthy. God, we just speak life to that body. And um, I'm sure many of us have people on our hearts that are going through things, Lord, whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, even our own things that we go through, God. We thank you that you hear our cries. We thank you that there's power in your name and there's power in your word. God, I pray... Um, as Tricia brought up, the, the prophetic voice. There's many who are, who are hearing, and God, help us to hear. And as Tricia was specifically requesting, that we would hear specifically what it is that you want us to do to prepare for upcoming things. God, your word is very clear on events that will transpire in the last days, the beginnings of the birth pains. God, help us to, to hear what it is that you want us to do specifically. Without fear, God, we can trust you at all times. And we thank you for giving your prophets, giving your people a heads up. Your word is truth, and we thank you for that. And God, just different anniversaries, different birthdays, different people celebrating and different people grieving. And Lord, I just thank you for meeting people right where they are. Thank you for the laborers who you've sent in the past and who you'll be sending. And we praise you. I thank you for every person who's here, God. God, every life matters. I thank you for just speaking your word to them directly. May they hear, may they grow and be strengthened and, and empowered by your word and your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um, can you flip your page in the very beginning of the book in the pocket? I'll just have you sing that while Joshua does the offering. Um, so, Lord, I thank you for everyone who gives, even if they don't. God, I just pray blessings over the people. Lord, I thank you for using this um, to further your kingdom. God, we're here. We are here for you. And God, may your, your will be done. Blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah, that was it. Right there, Britton. Thank you. You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, you are my everything. You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world to me. I wouldn't trade you for silver or gold. I wouldn't trade you for riches untold. You are, you are my everything. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So um, I'm going to be teaching this morning early, and I found something, and I sent it to sent it to a pastor who's a football coach with a lot, a lot of other people, and I uh, sent Mike one too because he's in the big into football, and and his son is into football, and I thought as a as a dad to a son, Joshua, can you come sit by your dad? He's going to actually read you something. You want to sit where the cajon is, and then Mike, if you could read this like a coach. This is a pastor. He's right. He's reading something about his coach and what meant to him. And Joshua, can you sit on that chair there? Your dad's going to read you something. And yeah, it's not super long, but it's about a five minute. And then if maybe you can, yeah, that's fine. You can sit there. That's fine. That's good. Just listen to the words, Mike, as if the Heavenly Father is speaking to you. And then go ahead and minister to your son and minister to the audience and what the Holy Spirit just wants to speak to you and through you in that. Okay, this is entitled, Be Where Your Feet Are. I haven't read this yet, so I'm not even sure what this is about. So it starts off, sometimes a statement that seems simple can carry a great message when you think about it. Be where your feet are is a common saying of my favorite football coach. Of course, in this world of football, it means to dwell in the present. If a player has a bad day, he stresses to them, not to let that play continue to distract them mentally and thereby causing the next play to be a bad one. The game is made up of many plays. In a sense, each play is an individual game. The player is to play each play individually, win the play, then win the next play, play the game one play at a time, play in the moment, be where your feet are. So I guess with football, you know, you have d different defensive formations that you have to think about. And though the play may not turn great, that one play, you have to reassess things and continue to go forth and do your best. So you can't let a bad play put you down for the next play. So don't get caught up in your past, okay? Don't look too far into the future, but look at your present day. It's just like worrying about something. How many times have we thought about something that's going to happen tomorrow or next week, and then the day that we're living in kind of goes to waste because we're too worried about that thing that hasn't happened yet. So I'll continue to read. Similarly, there is a really powerful message for us in life. Play one play at a time. Life is made up of days. The psalmist tells us to number our days in Psalms 90, 12. We would do well to live our lives one day at a time, and strive to win each day. Don't let yesterday ruin today. And by the same token, tomorrow's concern can ruin today as well. Kind of like what I just said. 
Paul had many bad things in the past to which he could dwell. I am sure he remembered his days of persecuting God's people. Yet, he writes to the Philippian church, forgetting those things which are behind. In Philippians uh, 3.13, I think Paul would have agreed with the be where your feet are idea. On the other hand, James urges us to be careful when making plans for tomorrow. James 4.13 reads, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there. Buy and sell and make profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. I think James would have liked be where your feet are sentiment as well. The idea to live today, one can't change the past. We all have regrets, but the blood of Jesus can forgive our mistakes of yesterday. According to Jeremiah 31, 34, God remembers them no more. Let us make the most of today. Let us be where our feet are today. My favorite football co coach also had a saying that this is in line with today's thoughts. Coach Bryant carried the following poem in his pocket, in his wallet. This is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or I can use it for good. What I do today is very important because I am exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, the day will be gone forever, leaving something in its place I have traded for it. I want it to be gain, not loss, good, not evil, success, not failure, in order that I should not forget the price I paid for it. Be where your feet are today. Make the most of today's opportunity. Win this day. That's good. That's really good. Which one? The, the first one at the top? All right, sometimes a statement that seems very simple can carry a great message when you think about it. Be where your feet are is a common saying of my favorite football coach. Of course, in this world of football, it means to dwell in the present. If a player has a bad play, he stresses to them not to let that play continue to distract them mentally and thereby causing the next play to be a bad one. The game is made up of many plays. In a sense, each play is an individual game the player is to play each play individually, win this play, then win the next play. Play the game one play at a time. Play in the moment where your feet are. Okay. Does that speak to anyone? Be where your feet are. Your mind will get lost sometimes, and, and it will drag you down. And you know what? We just have to just keep going. And where you place your feet is really important. And so the Lord has lots of wisdom in his word. And that's where we're going to go to this morning. If you have your scriptures, um, I will get over here and we'll begin. Thank you, Mike, for reading that. Anybody in here play football? Well, I never played football. But it, it speaks to me in regards to the daycare. We have to do write-ups, and we have kids there 10 hours a day. And in that last 30 seconds of the day, when I only am with a parent for maybe two minutes, 30 seconds, and I have to give them a report of their child that they bit, I would never give them that. But the state makes us, and I hate that moment. It's like... The parents are so mad at us. And I think to myself, it was like, do you know how many hours we're here in the day? It's like 10 hours in the day. And your child was bit by another baby in the last, like, five minutes. And, oh, I just, and Brooklyn now is in that position where she's greeting the parents at the end of the day. She's like, this is terrible. I mean, they hate you. They hate the teacher. They hate, the, they hate what you're doing. And you're like, oh. I mean, it's like, oh. It's awful, and I, and I just have had to go like, you know what, just release it. We'll do our best to make sure they're not biting each other, but kids are fast. You guys know that things that happen in life come fast sometimes, and those little moments that are so fast, and they're just like, I don't even know what happened in those moments. Anybody have any of those moments where you're like, that is just it is so fast, I don't even know what happened. And in life, God, in his love, is so rich in mercy. 
He can begin to direct you in things that would have happened so fast. He can now give you wisdom and be able to say, hey, I am full of, yes, grace and truth and mercy. He's a merciful God. And because he's merciful, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, and I'll begin to teach your heart. And I'll begin to teach not just your heart. I want to teach your feet. So everybody look at your feet. Look at your feet. Your own feet, not mine. Your feet. Look at your feet. Are your feet heading towards a net? And a treasure box of wickedness? If your heart has wickedness in it, and you draw out of the treasures of, of that wicked heart that you were forgiven from, if you begin to draw out of that, that's your flesh, and if you begin to draw out of that wicked heart, your feet are stepping into a net. Whose net? Not God's net. When God begins to make you a fisher of men, he begins to draw you into a different net and begins to show you a different treasure box, one that you hide his word in and one that you begin to grow in and blossom in. And that treasure box has life and wisdom. And so in that treasure box, can you guys have a visual of a foot? Now, you don't have to be wholly caught into that net you can get out of that net it's just your first little feet that are in there and god's like hey i want to give you some wisdom that's quick if your feet are in some in a net it can get tangled really fast do you know what i'm saying so we want to be careful of that and the, and when we see the psalmist he even talks about deliver me my feet from that net and and his heart is wise you can see his heart is like saying god i want you to purify my heart God, I have people who are against me, and, and again, I've sinned, and, and right now, judge my, my heart, and he's saying, God, I want you to direct me. I need your wisdom in this, and so we're going to see some scriptures that I, I believe are important in learning and growing in regards to God and how he can direct our, our heart, the ways of the Lord. The, my topic today is trusting the Lord with all of your heart. So we have two scenarios. We've got our feet that are going to make a choice. They're either going to choose to, hold, to pop open that old treasure box and live out of that old heart, live out of those old wounds, or we're going to take our feet the other direction and we're going to allow Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to have his way in us to work in our lives. It's either like you want the world, the treasures of this world, and the pain of this world, or do you want the crucified cross Life which brings the kingdom and the power and the wisdom and the glory that belongs to him. And it belongs to those who fear him. And he begins to download his wisdom. So in love, he gives us Proverbs chapter 3. Let's go there. Proverbs chapter 3. Where are your feet? So it's not just your feet that are important. Your feet are very valuable, which direction you're pointing in. But where is your heart in this? Let's read this. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Not just your soul and your mind where it's going. The enemy is the enemy of your soul. He can get your mind in the, in the garbage treasure box really fast. You can write down notes after notes after notes how deep that darkness goes and how wicked that wickedness is. But a mind that's fixed on God and saying, God, I don't want to trust in, in this darkness i want to trust in you lord with all of my heart let your words wash me let your words and then your kingdom will come and your will will be done and i'll begin to grow past these things that used to torment me i'll begin to rise above them in your wisdom so he says this in proverbs this is a wisdom solomon saying here we're going to get to psalms the psalmist as well but trust in the lord with all your heart with your heart Trusting in his word. Don't lean on your own understanding. Everybody point, touch your brain. Your brain is where you think. Your brain is where you process. And God says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, there's ways inside the heart that are separate from everybody. Touch your head. Now touch your heart. Pat your heart. There are ways. Everybody say, make a W. And say ways in the heart. 
Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, the ways of your heart, the ways of your heart, acknowledge him in your heart, and he will begin to direct your path. Don't be wise in your own eyes. You need to fear the Lord and depart from evil. So there's a little, there's a little bit of a nugget of a test right there. Did you see it? If you're going to trust in the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your own understanding, that means you're operating now out of the treasure box, the wisdom that you're getting from God's word. And now he's going to say to you, in, you're inclining your ear to hear him, and he's going to say, okay, see this test? There is a test that's approaching you. Now, I'm not okaying that test. I'm preparing you. I'm telling you there is a test that's coming. That doesn't mean that I give you clearance, that I'm saying, yeah, just have right at the test. The Bible's he's telling you, he's giving you the instructions. There's a test that's coming. Oh, God told me there's a test coming. I'll just be a ding-dong and just do the dumb thing. Is that what God says to do? No, with a test, he's saying the enemy of your soul is going to come with a test. Now, because you're operating out of the kingdom, time is going to get slowed down, and you're going to have some wisdom that's going to help you not to get your feet caught in a net, and then pretty soon you're all in a snare. He's going to keep your feet from the net. He's going to keep your feet, your feet, because your feet are toward towards him. Now he's saying, okay, you, you're listening. Your heart is listening. There's ways in your heart that the enemy has in you. Create in me a clean heart, the psalmist says. Oh, God, God created me a clean heart. I can feel the enemy coming and he's tormenting me. And God's like, right, let my words lead you your heart. Do not let lean on your own understanding in this. In all your ways, the ways of your heart need to be guarded. Now, you don't have your helmet on right now, but you got your breastplate on to guard your heart. But now your mind is fully open to the enemy. And you have no helmet on, God may tell you. And, and, and God's like, that's you. You're removing the helmet. And, and you're like, I am. I'm just letting that enemy free range like a chicken, just eating all my thoughts. And, and then the spirit. The fallows come, and the, yeah, and, and he's like, yeah, you're letting it all, just all the landing, all that enemy just land right on in there. And, you're, and God's like, yeah, you need to wear your helmet. And pretty soon, you need to take out your sword, and you need to speak out of your mouth, and you tell that devil where to go. You tell those thoughts where to go. You tell them to submit. And you tell them, no, you will not land. And so God, in his love, saying, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding in all of the ways, the ways of your heart, the ways of your mind, and your body, in all of your ways. You need to allow me to direct your path. So he says, the first thing he, get, he says is, is right, right after this. He says the first thing, don't be wise in your own eyes. I need you to fear the Lord and depart from evil. What do you mean I'm not doing anything evil? Right. But the devil in operation, that the person you're about ready to talk to, has a demon in them, and they know the enemy's ways, and that enemy's going to speak through that person, and that devil knows your past. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're saying. He knows what you're thinking because he's onslaughting you. So he's going to use that pretty little girl, or he's going to use that, that temptation down the street, or that corner, or you're just going to bypass that person and they're going to speak something to you. And the enemy is at work. And he says, I need you to depart from evil. The discernment, because you're opening up the treasure box you're of God's word that you're hiding. And you're inclining your ears to hear me. I'm going to deliver you from evil. But you would have not recognized that as evil. Had you been operating still in your old treasure box, you would have been like, oh, yes. And they would have been, they would have been, like, you know, people like to listen to soul music. They would have been baiting like a fish, like a fishing, like a, a fish hook. They're going to cast that net out, that cast that line out there, and they're going to soul bait you. Whoonk! And they're going to wheel you in, wheel you in from your soul to their soul. Counseling of the soul. Oh, yeah, they meet me on the same level. Oh, they understand. That's right. They counsel me. You know what? I talk about my pain. I talk about my wounds. I talk about, and they totally understand. And pretty soon, their unforgiveness, they're counseling you by it. And shoop, you get a yank of your soul right into that soul tie. 
And so the Lord's saying, you're not going to see that because you're not, your feet aren't in the net. I'm going to keep you from that because now you're listening. Your ways now are guided by my ways. And that, that little conversation that would have totally hooked, lined, pulled you right on in, I'm going to give you wisdom in it. And you know what? You're going to be able to fear the Lord is the very beginning of wisdom. And your eyes will not see people the same. Your eyes will say, kingdom-minded, devil-minded. That person is kingdom-minded, devil-minded. And then the Bible will say, you'll be able to operate in kingdom-minded, yeah, but now they're operating in devil-minded. Whoa, what? You mean a person can give me God's wisdom at first, and then pretty soon I'm telling them my wounds, and then pretty soon their wounds are now talking to me, and now they're counseling me out of their wounds, and now we're operating in, in the old treasure box together? Yeah. And God's saying, I'm going to direct your path if you let me. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. Listen to this is neat. Now, this can be three things. Because God made a spirit, he made a soul, and we've been given a body. Listen to this. If you will do these things, open up the treasure box, hide God's word in your heart, you begin to say, God, I'm not going to trust in this. I'm going to trust in your word for the very first time or the 13th time. Remember, it's always a season. Maybe you went through many seasons with the Lord. This is a brand new season. You got pruned a little bit or pruned a lot, but not unto death. I was learning about that today. I was telling my husband, like, how far can they, like, prune? And it says in there, you can get pruned to the place where the tree dies. God doesn't prune you to the death. He prunes you so that you would grow because you're already growing in him. It just might be a new season. Every, anybody been through a season with the Lord and then got pruned? Yes? It doesn't feel good, does it? But it's gonna, there's, there's seasons in, in our growth. There's seasons. And so in this, he's saying to you, whether this is your first time hearing this, whether this is just encouraging you to continue to grow, listen, he says, it shall be health. So if you're trusting in the Lord, leaning not on your own understanding, allowing him to direct your ways, your path, and your heart, you're not being wise in your own eyes, you're fearing the Lord, you're departing from evil, it shall be health to your navel, health and marrow to your bones. What does that mean? Health to your navel and marrow to your bones. Hey, babe, can you tell us really fast, can you holler out what marrow is? To the bones? And, and what is blood, what are white blood cells and, and they fight infection? So does that mean that if we're, we can get disease or we can reverse the disease by just honoring the Lord? According to his word, that's what I see. It says, it shall be health to your body and bring marrow to your bones. I mean, that's what he was saying in here. And I was like, wow, God, this is re healthy bone marrow releases blood cells. I'm like, okay, I'm going to look up that word. And healthy bone marrow releases blood cells in the bloodstream when they're mature, um, Without the bone marrow, our bodies, our bodies cannot produce the white cells we need to fight infection and their blood cells. We need to carry the oxygen and the platelets. We need to stop the bleeding. I'm like, God, this is like bigger than I'm understanding, but that's an amazing thing. So then I'm like, okay, God, I want to continue to read some more because I can see that you're at work here. Let's go to Psalms 119 about the position of the heart and how when God begins to, when you desire for God to create in you a clean heart, you're going to go through different seasons. The ways of the heart. Allowing God to get the ways of your heart. Psalms 119, let's go to verse 161. Psalms 119, 161. Listen to his heart position here. Princes, has, princes have leaders, let's say, leaders have persecuted me without a cause. He's talking to the Lord. 
And he's saying, leaders are persecuting me without a cause. Has anyone ever been through persecution and there really was no cause? I mean, we've gone through where there is a cause. But if you've ever been through persecution where there is not a cause, if you're growing up in the kingdom, you will go through that. And maybe you have been through that before, but you didn't know how to handle it. You're going to learn how to handle it if the Lord directs your heart. Leaders have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart stands in the awe of the, your word. So he was saying his heart was going to stand in awe of the word because the word was counseling him. The word was, the power was coming to, to meet. And, and I rejoice at the word as one finds great spoil. Have you ever gone in and like seen, have you ever been fishing before and you just come into a huge abundance of fish? Has anybody, does anybody fish? And you just, it's amazing to come in a spool and you fish and you catch it and it's exciting. Has anybody caught a fish before? It's really exciting. It's probably like a football game, touchdown. Anybody excited about that? Well, when you begin to rejoice at God's word, when he begins to speak to you, it's like a treasure in there. When God speaks intimately to you through his word, it becomes like hidden treasure. You find it. And, you, and he's saying here, I hate and abhor lying. But I, the law, I do, do I love? And for one person on one side, they'd be like, yeah, they're lying about me. And another person, like the psalmist right here, is saying, I hate lying. I hate all of this that I'm going through. But I love your law. I love your word. I don't like these lies. I don't like the, the lies that are operating through people and, and the falsehood. I don't love it at all. God, I don't love it. But I love your word because it's like a treasure during this season. So seven times a day, he says, I will praise thee. Do you see how, what he's doing? Is he do, he's rejoicing in the Lord because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have they which love your law and nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have a hope for thy salvation. If you find yourself operating in offense with someone, I'm just letting you know, you guys, listen. It's a step into the net. Step into the altar. Offenses are going to come. And you're going to have to say, God, I'm wounded. I don't want to go there. Pull open the treasure box of God's word and allow him to counsel. You don't want your heart to go into offense mode. You don't want it to be easily offended. And this is what he was saying here. If you read that again, great peace have they which love God's law and nothing shall offend them. They're loving his word. It's guarding them. Lord, I have hope for your salvation and I've done your word. My soul hath kept thy testimonies and I love them exceedingly. I have kept your precepts and, and thy testimonies for all my ways are before thee. See, his heart, he knew that his heart was uh, was undone in the presence of the lord he was recognizing in this moment that he was operating with the unity of the spirit he wasn't operating in offense but he was operating and knowing that there was a persecution that he was going through let's say a trial that he was going through now you don't always have to go through a trial with people I mean, it might start off with people. It might start off with the enemy through them. But then there's going to be a season in your life where you're recognizing it really is the devil. And your heart, presenting it to the Lord, will be a safe haven. Letting the Lord guard your heart above all these things. He says, I have kept thy precepts. I've kept your precepts. Ready? A precept upon precept upon precept upon precept like a play, like a game. You're, you're learning the play, and I've kept it, and I'm learning the move, and I kept it, and I'm learning the next step, and I kept it, and I'm trusting in you, and I've kept it. So he's following that God. God, I want my heart pure. I, I want to keep it in this season humbly before you, God. I, I, don't, I, I, didn't, I didn't step into the net with that offense, and, but God, I've kept your precepts. Let my cry come near before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to your word. Now, everybody point to your lips. My lips shall praise thee when you've taught me your statutes. And then there's your tongue, even deeper inside of you. My tongue shall speak of thy word. For all thy commandments are righteous. 
Now put up your hand. And he's saying, let thine hand, let your hand help me, for I'm choosing your precepts. This heart that's governed in all your ways, acknowledge him, is going somewhere with the kingdom. Going somewhere with the Lord. And his kingdom is coming. His will is going to be done. He's going to impart unto you in this, in this season, in this time. And he says, let my soul live and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. He was recognizing there was a difference between his heart and his soul. Listen, he says, let my soul live, because his soul was being bombarded, but his heart was being guarded in all his ways of his heart. He was acknowledging him and letting him direct his path. Do you know that you can be comforted by God's spirit by being, by being attacked by the enemy? And then God is going to teach you and make you ready to be a soldier. To be able to learn how to fight battles that you never won before, governed under this mind, you're defeated every time. You sound like your pain. You think like your pain. You hurt like your pain. Your spirit hurts. Your soul hurts. Your physical body is hurting. That's a mind that's fixed on the flesh. Oh, and how hurt those things are. How deep those things are. But a mind... In him, there's peace, and there's life, and there's the freedom that's there. Our help comes from the Lord. Let's keep going here. Verse 174, I have longed for your salvation. This is not something that maybe has just happened overnight. This is a season. I have longed for this rescue mission of this situation. Oh, Lord, thy law is my delight. He has learned to delight in, his, in the word. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Wait, what? Whoa, 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 wait. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Well, I thought that he was presenting his heart, that he was making right choices, and that he wasn't letting the offense come. But he's positioning himself humbly before the Lord and saying, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. His soul was lost. But his heart was being running to the Father, running to his mercy, running to him. He knew where his help would come from. Listen again. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I, have, I do not forget your commandments. He's saying, I've wandered off the right path somewhere, my thoughts. My body maybe wasn't getting trapped in the net. My heart is wanting your ways. But my soul is like, I feel like I've wandered off. And who's the good shepherd of the soul? Jesus is. So in this word, we're going to go to the heart of the Father. Look, we're going to look at a scripture verse that I just, I, I saw it today, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to miss it. Matthew 12. We see a couple different people groups here. We see the ones that love the law to the place where you're, you are dead in your sin and they hate you. Because the law is the law and the law, I, I don't know if you guys have ever had anybody hold the law up to you, but it wasn't done with mercy. I've had people hold the law up to me in season where the law was the law, and I don't care how much cross you have died to, you're, they're, you're never dead to them, and they're going to hold that devil. will make sure that you will know that you sinned. You've always a sinner. You'll be a sinner. You're dead. You're going to die like a sinner. You're going to have consequences in you, and, it, and it's almost like, you know, has anybody been thumped on their chest before? That, that kind of accusation by the devil. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? If it's not a human, it's the devil. He shames you. And you don't know, it's like you're dead, like a, like, a, 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 like a cow that's dead, and the devil will pick up the cow and say, you need to keep killing the cow. And it's like, the cow's dead, I don't know how to die anymore to it, it's dead. Does that make sense? And you're like in this, like, I don't know what to do. Like, it's to the place where you're, you don't know what to do because it's, the devil is so shaming. Has the enemy ever shamed you before? Hey, and he carries shame. And so if a person is operating through the shame, that shame will shame you, but if it's not the per and if it's not the person, it's not the person. They just might be carrying it like a like a carrier, like a mail carrier. They might be just carrying it, or it's just the devil himself bringing shame because he 
He permeates stink, stench, shame. That's how he, that's his atmosphere. So when you get to this place where we're in a position where Jesus now is in the ministry, you're going to see different types of people coming to Jesus. You're going to have the law abiders that don't love his word with mercy. They love it to the place to shame. And the Satan holds, the, holds God's word to shame. God's word will hold God's word in truth with a righteous judgment with mercy in mind in the end to bring about judgments into victories. So let's look at Jesus' heart here. I love this. I don't know who this is for, but I pray that the Lord will speak life into your heart, revive life into your heart. Matthew chapter 12, verse 11, verse 10. And behold, there was a man which had a withered hand. Why did he have a withered hand? Well, backing up at that other scripture verse, you can get sick from sin. Was he born with it? Was it his parents' sin? Either way, it came from the fall. Was it his own sin, and then sin entered into his hand? Did he sin, and then, and then shoomp his hand withered? Was he sick from something? Sickness didn't come from God, so it came from the, ultimately from the fall, from sick. So there was a sin, whether it came generationally or it came through uh, the bloodline generation, it's the sin, or it came through his own sin. Something happened, and he has this, this hand. And, they, and so, and behold, there was a man which had this withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they may accuse him. So they were already going to accuse him. The question that they asked the man wasn't going to be merciful for mercy's sake. It was going to be to accuse. If that's you, you're, you're not operating in kingdom. You're operating in a dark kingdom. So guard your heart, wash your heart. When you can ask a question without accusation and say, like, this is okay to ask. Is it, is it okay? Is this okay to ask? Is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? Versus, is it okay to do something like that on the Sabbath? Very different, same question, very different what? Different what? Different heart positions. And he said unto them, but he had told you what heart they were operating in, an accusatory heart. And when he said unto them, what man shall there be among you, so this is Jesus' ministry now, that shall have one sheep. He's trying to make this make sense to them in love. What man there among you that shall have one sheep, if it falls into the pit on the Sabbath day? I mean, look at his, listen to his mercy. If he falls into the pit, will you not go lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is this man better than a sheep? Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? Now watch what he does. Now he's going to operate in the kingdom power. He was operating out of the heart. Now the power is going to come. Then he said unto the man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched forth his hand, and it was restored whole. Whole. Whole is all of it. Whole. And it was restored whole. Then the Pharisees, the ones that had the law but didn't love it with mercy, didn't love it with a, a heart that was, that was circumcised. It was just the letter they had. They had the letter, and the letter will kill you. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to say it anymore. If you've never had the letter try to kill you, I mean, it is there to expose, but it is not there to kill the dead cow if you've already died to the cross. Does that make sense? But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from that then, and a great multitude began to follow him. They wanted to be healed. They began to follow Jesus. They began to follow him. So there's the, the law, but they began to follow the, the love of the Jesus who, who was, came and and he was operating in this kingdom, this power, and this love. And it was his kindness that led these people to going. They probably maybe even knew with that withered man's hand that who he was and what he had done. And he healed them. That was the Lord's heart. That was his mercy. And Jesus knew it. He withdrew. All these multitudes followed him. And he charged them that they should not make him known. Verse um, 20. Listen to this. 
Oh, the verse 19. He shall not strive, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. And this is his heart. A bruised reed. All these people are coming with the wounds. All these people with devils are coming. All these people with their, that are blind. Why were they blind? Why did they have devils living inside of them? How did those devils get inside of them? What sin did they do that opened up that door that that devil was living inside? Why, was they, why were they mute? What spirit entered into them? What had they done? They came to Jesus with all their issues. And he's saying here in verse 20, I love this verse. If you don't have a pen, this is the verse that you want to go to. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench till he sends forth judgment into victory. When he sends a judgment, he'll judge something accurate. And when you walk through a judgment with him, there's an end of it in the judgment, and it will bring forth great victory. There's something called what most people don't ever run the race with the Lord for. They bail out because the enemy is the enemy of your soul, and he, he wants you to bail out. He doesn't want you to break through. Because at the end of that judgment, there's such training that goes on, such heart pivoted direction training by the Holy Spirit in the judgment that what would have killed you before has led you to a death on a cross following Christ because of the love of the mercy that meets you in the judgment. And he begins to give you his wisdom. He begins to give you his power. He begins to give you his wealth of counsel and the sevenfold spirit of God begins to minister to you to give you an understanding. Let's say you're the person with the withered hand and you know your past and you know what that felt like, but you came to the one who would save you and you have all these accusers behind you saying, should you heal him on this day? Why would you heal him on this day? We want to kill you for trying to heal this man. And there will be accusers of the brethren. There will be the devil's voices when these miracles start taking place in your life. But guess what? God's sending forth a judgment into victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Then were brought unto him one possessed with the devil and the blind and the dumb, and, and he healed them, insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake, and they saw. You guys, this is his heart to send judgments into victory to send forth his word, and to bring healing into your life and into the things that you thought that never the Lord could have never done. So in his word, let's go to Jeremiah chapter, uh, Joshua chapter 1 verse 3 really fast, jo really fast. Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. We're going to continue on with the heart. We're going to continue on with the feet. And we're going somewhere and then we'll close. Joshua chapter 1 verse 3 says, Every place, every place, this is what the Lord's speaking to Joshua. So mo no more Moses. No. Moses led them to the promised land, but he didn't go in. This is the part of the cross. This is, this is your cleansing season. This is the, they're gonna, you're going to learn to be a warrior now in the, next, in the next season of your life, learning to inherit things. And so Joshua's getting raised up. And, and so God is saying to Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Every area that your feet go, being mindful of the plays, being aware that God is with you. Even when the enemy of your soul comes to attack you, you can have your heart guarded in him and allowing the Lord to direct your heart in all your ways of your heart. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 31. Starting with verse 16, he says, Oh, this is such a good chapter. Let's start with verse 1. I'm going to skip around this really fast. 31, verse 1. At the same time, saith the Lord, listen to his heart, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Remember, they, they've harlotted themselves out. He so wants them. Thus the Lord the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. 
The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. With his loving kindness he has drawn thee. Oh, your heart was wayward. With loving kindness he's drawing us. Verse 9. They shall come with weeping. Is that okay? Is repentance? Do you see people in full-on real repentance a weeping? And even if you don't feel that, and there's just a feeling of a hardness and you come to the Lord, there will be a season where you'll understand that the weeping is like a mourning and it's like a freedom at the same time. And they will come with weeping and with supplications. They're going to come with a prayer request. They're going to come before his throne room. Will I lead them in the weeping and then the supplication? I will lead them. He's leading them back. If this is a bigger picture, he's leading them back. I will, he says, cause them to walk by the rivers of the waters in a, in a straight way. Wherein they shall not stumble. These are people who are used to stumbling. And he's saying, I will lead them in my loving kindness back in a way where they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. When you look up that story about Jacob, you're like, he got ransomed from something that was stronger than him? You mean there was a spiritual realm around Jacob that was scaring him, trying to go after an inheritance that wasn't his? He was going to get it in a different way, but he tried to get it his own. And, and if you follow the family's journey, God is after this family. His loving kindness is after this, the heart of this family. And the Lord redeemed Jacob, he said, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. He kept ransoming this family from generation to generation. He so wants them. Therefore, they shall come and, and they're going to sing in the height of Zion. This is what his prophetic word can see this. And they'll begin to flow together to the goodness of the Lord. For wheat and for wine and for oil and for young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden. Their, their soul will be as a watered garden. And they shall not sorrow any more at all. They came to him weeping. They came to him with supplication. And he says, I, I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way. And I will cause them to flow together, bringing unity and, and their soul will begin to be watered. When a soul begins to be watered, it's beginning to prosper. And they will not sorrow anymore. And they will begin, the, then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into what? Joy. That's his heart. He can do that. And I will comfort them. And I will make them rejoice from their sorrow. Seeking the Lord in all your ways that's where he's going to lead you. It's a walk of faith. But from faith to faith, he's leading you. And I will tie the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, a voice heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Um, Rahel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. That was a season. Thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping. It's time to stop weeping, he's saying. This is a new season. And your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded. Remember I've been talking to you guys about and encouraging myself. What you've done for the Lord will be rewarded. Your time that you're spending with him will be rewarded, saith the Lord. And they will come again from the land of the enemy. You're coming out of the land of Egypt. And you're coming out of learning how to operate out of your old heart into this new heart. And, and now he's giving you wisdom not to operate and even getting close to the traps. And now you're in this position where now he's showing you even how to get your soul out of snares. And how he, he's able to rescue 
your your thoughts and in these seasons that he operates in he's going to give you hope and now listen to this what he says because inside of these seasons you have questions that come and i destroyed that group and i hurt that one and god and then i didn't understand and i i don't even know what how are you going to do all that he says i will you're putting your trust in the one that says i will i will make the river i will make the way i will Trust in me with all your heart. Don't lean on your old understanding. In all your ways, I will restore it whole. Look at what I did. Look at my son. I sent him. I showed you how the kingdom can come whole. My heart is whole. My heart is to bring you into the wholeness, to the shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. It comes back in return, all restored, like booty, the whole thing. It will be like treasure. You're coming into the treasures of God. You're coming into the inheritance of God. And he says there, and there is hope in thine end, said the Lord, that thy children are going to come again back to their own border. Is there hope in that? That your children are going to return as if nothing was missing, as if nothing was broken, all restored, all returned. So he gives us this, this little bit and this little ending, verse 18, and we're almost done. So incline your ears because he says that the ending, there's hope in the end. There's hope in thine end. I have surely heard Ephraim, remember his firstborn, bemoaning himself. He's saying, I have heard you weeping. I've heard your pain. You're my firstborn. I love you. You've left me. I'm, my loving kindness is pulling you back. And listen to Ephraim's cry. Listen to what God hears as his cry. You've chastened me. I was chastised as a bullock, unaccustomed to that yoke that I walked in. This is his heart saying, I wasn't that little quick move that caused the play to fail, which caused you to lose the game. And, and it wasn't about the whole team or the two hours of the game. It was about what you did. This is the enemy. About how you did that one moment in time move that changed your trajectory of your whole entire life. And the enemy is almost like this magnifying zooming glass. Zoom, he zooms in on it for you in seasons. And you're going to have to like the psalmist. God, I'm not going into sin. But God, this devil is nasty. In all your ways, Tricia, in all your ways, Nate, say your name. Direct, let me direct your path. I'm going to keep you from the enemy. I'm going to give you, don't go by your eyesight, but I'm going to give you a vision. I'm going to give you a bigger picture of what's happening. And in all your ways, acknowledge me, and I will direct your path. And, and though the enemy is going to come, the righteous are going to go through much, but I'm going to deliver you from them all. And, and he's saying, listen to Ephraim's cry. Listen to him. He's saying, I was not accustomed to, to that kind of a yoke. Turn thou to me, he says, and I will turn thou to you. This is God in this conversation. For thou art thy Lord, my God. God is hearing him crying out, and God saying, if you turn to me, I will turn to you. And this is Ephraim's cry, and God's hearing it. And, and although Ephraim might not be able to hear God saying, Ephraim, I hear you saying you're turning to me, and you're crying out for me to turn to you. I'm so towards you. I'm so towards you. I'm so for you and that loving kindness. So Ephraim is growing in this maturity and he's beginning to understand there's another voice of accusation that is, doesn't sound like the voice of the father. It's not rich in mercy, it's rich in shame. Just like the man with the withered hand could hear Jesus saying, you're healed. And he could hear the other people saying in his, by his soul because he could hear with his ears and your soul, you process it. He could hear them saying, why would you heal that man? And he could hear, like, it does say on the law that I can't heal. I shouldn't do anything on that day. And God's like, I may have the pattern. And it's there to expose what's exposed. But my heart, if you rip open the law, it is the love of God that will meet you in mercy. Down deep, 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 down into, if you rip open the law, and you go down to his heart, you're going to find he's rich in mercy. So he says, when you love the God's word, you're going to be able to see with a heart that's ripped open, God, I know that you have a way. I want to love you not by just the letter. I want to know, rip open the commandments. Show me your heart. 
And he says, listen, verse 19, surely after that I was turned and I repented. This is Ephraim. God heard him cry out. He repented. And after that I was instructed. He repented and was instructed the same way the psalmist was. He, hadn't, he wasn't sinning, but he was feeling the torment, and he was feeling the shame. He was asking God all these questions, and, and yet God was showing him spirit and soul and his body and showing that if you all, all your ways acknowledge me, I'll bring health to your body. I'll bring, I'll bring life to your mind. I'll begin to instruct your ways and your soul, and I'll show you how to guard your heart simultaneously, and, and there will be this flowing together, and, and I'm going to show you how I can ransom you. And, and now comes the time where Ephraim, God already knew that. He was speaking through Jeremiah the prophet to these people and they wouldn't listen. But now comes the time where there is a listening. And I've surely heard Ephraim. He's moaning. He's even saying, I don't even know how I got into this yoke. I was not accustomed to walking into that kind of a sin and I didn't know that it was one that even if a toe got into there that it would grab me by the toe and pull me and, and there's no release. I can't get out of it. And he's saying, God, turn to me and I will return to you for you are my God. Surely after that I, was, I turned and I repented. And after that I was instructed. I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed. Yea, even confounded because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Listen, is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Now listen to what he gives. He's give these, remember he said instructions are coming. Set thee up wayworks. I'm like, what's a waywork? So I looked it up. It says set up signs, symbols, a route, a footpath. Set up signs on the footpath. Make thee high heaps, and you set your heart toward the highway. The highway, holiness. In holiness, God has people's hearts in holiness. When they walk in a level of holiness, God has their heart because they opened up their heart and they said, show me your ways. And my heart would be in you, in service in you for ministry. God, minister to me. I want to minister to you. God, I praise thee. Seven, there's liars everywhere, the tormenting of my soul. But God, cause my, my tongue and my, and my mouth to begin to praise you and instruct me by your word. And truth will come, and his wisdom will come, and his holiness comes. And he begins to set their heart towards the highway. Listen, listen, we're done here, listen. Verse 25 says, For I have, I have satisfied the weary soul. I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Upon this I awakened. I woke up. And beheld my sleep was sweet unto me. He woke up. He began to understand. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of the beast, and it will come to pass. Now watch the season. and Watch the season. Watch the season. Listen, this is a new beginning. And it will come to pass that like as I watched over them, to pluck them up, to break them down, to throw them down, to destroy, you're all somewhere along the way. We're all somewhere along the way in this. To afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. Lord Jesus, you continue to tell them, I'm going to forgive you of your iniquity, and I will remember your sin no more. Yes, you may have been plucked up, You've been broken down, thrown down, destroyed, afflicted. But I've been watching over you. My heart is a heart of mercy to build you, to plant you, saith the Lord. Lord God, I just I pray, Jesus, that you would just have your way in this word. That we would learn the ways of the Lord. You say to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. God, in Psalms 25, you can keep your eyes closed. The musicians can come. Just listen to these words. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. 
All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. The meek he will guide in judgment, and the meek he will teach his ways. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. There's secrets with the Lord. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn unto me, have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted, and the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Look, up, look upon my affliction and my pain. And he's recognizing, forgive all my sins. There are times where you are, are walking humbly before the Lord, and it's not now your soul. You can see that there's a bitter root that's in there. You can tell because it's, it's different than in your soul. There's a root. And the Lord wants to root out those areas. Cleanse me. God, forgive me. Now cleanse me from all unrighteousness. There may be a, something that's deeper in there that the Lord will take you on a journey to pluck it out, to root it out, to get rid of. And so, Lord Jesus, wherever we're at on this journey with you, God, in our faith walk, from faith to faith, from glory to glory, God, your, your eyes are before us and your loving kindness is towards those and your power is towards those that believe. You are so rich in mercy, God. And so, Lord Jesus, I ask today that this would speak a mighty truth. God, as we become more heightened, aware of something in our life, that you're trying to move our foot and pivot it out of the wicked, out of the net, our, there will be an awareness that will come because your kingdom will reveal things in the supernatural well realm to keep us out of the webs, to keep us out of the nets to keep us to hear when somebody's not, not counseling or operating in the kingdom, but um, maybe giving you good worldly advice that's a bait for your soul. Holy Spirit, however it is that you need to, to direct us, God, we want your heart. And so, Lord, our heart has to be instructed by you, by your word. And the word will become a lamp for our feet it will become a light unto our path. It will bring us to a position in our heart of understanding, God, you're holy. It'll give us into a position where we will understand your ways. It'll bring us into a greater understanding of the purposes and the callings that you have placed upon not just my life, but other people, Lord Jesus, who are running the race, running towards you, not from you. And so, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being rich in mercy. Thank you, God, for knowing that you're going to send judgments into victory. And some are right there, right at that, right there, right at the victory. You're in the battle. The battle's going to get heated up right before that victory. So, God, I pray that the word of our mouth and the meditation of our heart would be pleasing unto you. Will you guys say that with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may they be pleasing unto you. God, may my hand be like your hand. May I begin to write your word until the word is so written on my heart that there's no difference in my heart from your heart. I give you permission to expose anything in my heart that is not of you. I give you permission. God, send this judgment into victory. Teach me your ways. And I will follow in your truths. I know that your loving kindness is calling me. And just as the psalmist did in his journey, he began to praise the name of the Lord. And as we sing, God, these songs, I pray, God, that our, our whole spirit, our whole soul, and our body would be present. God, you're looking for those who will worship you in spirit and in truth. So, God, as we pray, as we worship, may this be how we learn how to fight a battle. And may we get to see how when we sing and we engage our heart, 
we begin to understand, God, that you are fighting a battle and it, there's a victory that comes. Sometimes they're quick. So let's all stand together and let's sing and lead. Some people that are here today, maybe all of you, all of us, will be walking themselves into a victory, into a healing. Remember he says that he'll begin to um, bring marrow to the bone, healing to the body. So if worship has been boring to you, may it not be. May it be your medicine. May it be life. Right. We're going to sing about praising him. You guys can stand, like I said, whatever you want to do. All creatures of a God and King, lift up your voice and with the sea. Praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Even We're going to sing, Come, Lord Jesus, now. <laughs>
God, help us to listen. God, speak to us. God, speak to us and speak through us. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. We thank you for meeting us right where we are. God, I pray that your word would go forth and that it would accomplish that which you send it to accomplish this very day. Thank you, God, for your goodness, for your mercy, for your love. God, we thank you for your mercies that are new every day. And God, we just ask right now, I ask, Lord, that I would just be step out of the way and that you would have your way, God. I pray that you'd speak. I pray that you'd speak clearly, loudly, effectively, God. That every, every ear at the sound of my voice, God, they wouldn't be hearing me. They'd hear your word. That They'd hear your word. That they'd hear your word. God, open their eyes of understanding. Open their ears to hear you speaking clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you, my family, go out that way so you can see what I have up on there, please? If you wouldn't mind, that would be great. Okay. So last week I gave you guys a little, I'm going to give Treasure a Bible just a second. Just a brief little thing that came to me last week. Don't kiss the former. That's, that's not holding on to the things of the past. That's letting go of activities, behaviors, things that have been done to you, unforgiveness, whatever it may be. Did anybody bring a scripture that they wanted to share? Did anybody get an opportunity to look anything up? Felix, you did? Romans, what is your chapter? Romans 7. What was me, a oh, wretched man that I am? I so wanted to take him back to the places... But he was humble. Well, we're going to be in eight. So if you guys do have your Bibles, we will be in eight. Um, can I have the remote, please? Is it back here? Can you hand that? Thank you. So... So the message I'm going to give you, I'd prepared this. 
the majority of it. I mean, I typed it today, honestly, but I had written it out before I went on my trip. And I had a little scenario, a situation transpire when I got to the airport, and I'm going to share that at the end of my message. Um, I don't know who this is for. It could be for many people. could be for one person. But God gives us warnings. And sometimes that one warning is the chance that we're going to get. And I'm going to revisit this at the end, like I said. We get a warning, and we need to heed to the warning that the Lord gives us. If, he, if you know that there's an area in your life that needs to be cut off, if, there, if you know there's something idolatry, something that you're putting before God that needs to be changed, needs to be transformed, needs to have heart work that you need to forsake and leave behind and abide in the will of God. Today is the day to make an, a decision. Every day we choose. It's a choice. It's a choice to, to listen. It's a choice to obey. So I pray, Lord, just awaken us all. Help us. God, reveal to us that we would have ears to hear. So be conscious about listening to what God would want to speak to you. So today, just a quick overview. Um, I'm going to, this passage came, I was reading in Genesis, and Genesis 17 about the covenant God had made with Abraham. And then there were just there was more to it. We're going to talk about the covenant God made with Abraham and what Abraham was supposed to do. And then we're going to talk about Jesus' words about abiding in the vine and his commands and then the B, B-E attitudes, the, the way that we are to be. And then the flesh versus the spirit, the freedom and forgiveness, and then new life in Christ. So quickly, Genesis 17. The story was that um, Abraham was 99 years old. God had given him a promise years before that his family, through his family, there was going to be a multiplication. There was going to be descendants. And you know the story of how um, Abraham and Sarah, or maybe it was Abram and Sarah at that point. I'm, I, this moment, I'm not sure exactly, but um, it was Abram still. They took, they took matters into their own hands because, yes, I am sure. It was still Abram. His name hadn't been changed yet, and Sarai's name had not been changed to Sarah yet. And they took matters into their own hands, but that's not where we're going today. We're going Well, it is. I want you not to take matters into your own hands. I want you to follow what God's word has called you to do. So in Genesis 17, it says here, when Abram was 90 years old, if you have your Bibles, follow along. I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to elaborate. When he was 90 years old and nine, so he was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. What did he say? He told him who he was. I am God, basically. Be perfect. How do we become perfect? Putting on that robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to us. It says, be ye holy, for I am holy. When we're following the commands of the Lord and we're doing his will, that's where we're to be, right? So here, I am, excuse me, I will make a covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. The kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan. For an everlasting possession, I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man 
child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between, betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any strangers, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, circumcised that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Then Sarai, her name was changed. She is blessed is my title here, or the title of my Bible. And God said unto Abram, As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with thee for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after thee. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off t talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And then it says, And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the same day, self same day, as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised of the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised as Ishmael, his son, and all the men of the house, born in the house, and bought with money of the strangers were circumcised with him. Okay, so this, is, this was the sign of this covenant. Ab <coughs> Excuse me, God meets with Abram. 99 years old, presents who he is, gives instruction, walk before me, be thou perfect. God presents his covenant. I will make my covenant with you and I will multiply thee exceedingly. But something had to be cut off. Something of the flesh was cut off in a physical way. For us, in a spiritual sense, Trisha was already talking about the circumcision of the heart and abiding, abiding in the vine, that pruning, that process, that season. There are things, if there are things, that we need to have cut off, that we need to have removed. I'm talking about in a spiritual sense, maybe physical, maybe there are things that we are doing that need to be discontinued or there may be things that we're not doing maybe we need to be spending more time with the lord if he's calling you to do something there are things that we have to die to self we have to die to self abraham fell on his face there was that covenant presented his name was changed Something was cut off. He was a new man. When God gives us a promise, he's going to bring it to pass. He'll bring it to pass. When he gives us instructions, he wants us to follow them. So if you see in the message, it said that he did it that same day. 
God's given you an instruction, does he want you to delay? He wants you to act. So in our lives, there are sometimes things that must die in order for something else to come forth. So I want us to go to John 15. These are words of Jesus. I, verse 1, I am the vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every man that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. There is a cutting away, so that what? Growth will come forth. It says, now you are clean. Through the word which I have spoken unto you, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No one can ye, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my what? In my love. And if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And it says, these things have I spoken unto you that what? That your joy might be full. You want fullness of joy? Abide in in God's word. Abide in his commandments. I'm going to skip down and I want to read, let's see. Verse 20, let's see. I'm going to go to chapter 12 actually. Go to John 12. So in John chapter 12, Jesus was talking. People were talking to him. Verse 22, it says, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew, and Philip telleth Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Back up, sorry, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. And the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. So these people from another area came. They wanted to see Jesus. And Philip, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat... Fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, what? It bringeth forth what? Much fruit. There are things in us that may need to be purged, that may need to die in order for life to come forth. That pruning, like Trisha said, the season, that process, it's not always easy. But through it, through it, life, life. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If a man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. It's all about relationship. Serving Jesus says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. 
But for this cause came I unto this hour. Then Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. And then it says, then came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. God spoke from heaven. And the people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. And Jesus said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus was going through some stuff. He was getting ready to go to the cross. He was going to endure pain. He was going to endure things. There's going to be a time, Trisha um, just briefly alluded to it, uh, about the things that prophets are saying. There are times ahead that are coming that are going to be very difficult. The last days are not going to be easy. We think we've seen some hard times, but Stand on the word. That's your firm foundation. Look to Jesus, the author, the finisher of your faith. So I'm going to go to Matthew 5 right now. We all need, we need him. We need him. This Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to read the very beginning of Jesus' words here. I'm, and then I'm going to skip to the end of that particular chapter. So Matthew 5, it says, And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. You guys are in a discipleship program. You're there for a reason. God has called you there. You wouldn't be there if you weren't called. And you made a decision to be there, and you made a decision to stay. You made a decision to come back and come back and come back, because God has drawn you there, right? Yeah. It says, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, number one, well, verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Somebody who's poor in spirit is realizing their need for the Savior. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. When we mourn over our sin, it is Christ alone that's going to give us that peace, well, along with the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And then I want to read... Uh, verse 48, which is the very last verse in chapter 5. You can go and read that at home. He's talking about the law. He's talking about anger. He's talking about sexual sin, talking about oaths, about loving your enemies. And verse 48 says, Be ye therefore what? Perfect. Even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. Be like Jesus. To be like him. Oh, to be like you, I give up my life just to know you. Be perfect as he is. Okay? Romans 8. I skipped something, sorry. Romans 8. The flesh versus the spirit. My sister posted this on online the other day. I was like, that's perfect. That just goes right along with what I'm teaching. I'm going to start with verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. What are you concentrating on? What are you meditating on? It says, But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. 
For to be carnally minded is what? Death. But the spiritually minded is life, to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God if we are walking in the flesh. The works of the flesh, we talk about it, the two trees. There's the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and then there's the works of the flesh, all those things. Look in Galatians 5, study them out. There are things in there that you need to be purified of. Study it out, study it out, study it out. Verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but, are in, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And verse 11, but if the Spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also what? Quicken, bring to life, revitalize your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The spirit of the living God dwelling in you, you'll be transformed and changed. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about forgiveness. Let's go to Psalm 32. Actually, um, the uh, verse of the day on the U version was Psalm 32. Uh, somebody have their phone? The verse of the day? Bethany, you have U version on your phone? What verse is it? Eight? I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. But I want to read the whole chapter. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. But verse 1, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Have you ever been forgiven of something and there was just such a freedom in it? Anybody? You just, you finally, you had the talk and somebody finally, you could, you just know they forgave you and there was a freedom. So blessed, happy is though, is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed or happy is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. You're not being charged with it. And in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long we got to call out to the lord ask him ask him it says for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me my moisture is turned into drought of summer there are times and seasons of life where we are dry there's times in the seasons of life where our tears are are bringing moisture and then sometimes we just we've cried so much whether it's a, a physical crying or an inward crying out, that we become parched. And then, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. What does it say? I acknowledge my sin unto thee. And mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Pause and think about that. And that says, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Verse 7, Thou art my what? My hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me with Compass me about with songs of deliverance. And then it says Selah again. Think about that. He encompasses us with songs of deliverance. And that verse 8 again, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. That is what the word of God does for us. Teaches us in the way that we should go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And then it says, being not as the horse or as the mule... 
which have no understanding. Whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord. Mercy shall compass him about. And then verse 11. Be glad in the Lord and what? Rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy. Shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. How often do you shout for joy? Not enough. I don't do it enough. It takes a lot to, to bring some joy out. I'm more of a somber person, I think, a lot of the time. <laughs> I'll say something silly and... God is good. Yeah. Okay, John 3. You must be born again. We're all born of the Spirit. I mean, not born of the Spirit. We're all born of flesh. We're born of the water. But we got to be born of the Spirit. Being born once and born again, you must be born again. If you want to be in the kingdom of God, you want to be strengthened, you want to have new life. You want to have a new focus, a new purpose. You can't do it your way. That's the bottom line. You can't do it your way. Okay, so I have my, my illustration. You guys see this picture here? Okay, let me see. I've got a light. Does it work? Okay, see, this, see these beams right here? You guys know I went to Florida, not this last, the week before. Hadn't been to the airport in a very long time. Okay, so this, does anybody know what this is? This is the entrance into the parking garage. So on my way into the parking garage, you guys see the arrow right here? There's these little things that hang down. And if your vehicle is higher than that, it bangs on your vehicle or bangs on, in my case, I had a big box on top. So I actually, I didn't know what the regulations were. I didn't know what the command was. I didn't know what the guideline was. So you know what I did? I proceeded right here through warning number one. This warning number one was on, I think, chains that would move. I pulled in and I thought, you know what, I better stop and look because this right here was a metal frame. You guys see the metal frame right there? I look up and I see, you know what? That's <laughs> not okay. I'm not going to make it. I look sideways and the guy next to me, he goes. So, me, I get out of my vehicle. Standing on my tire, leaning over. Thank the Lord the box wasn't full of junk like it usually is. I'm leaning over, and I'm like, Jesus, we can do this. And I'm like, I mean, this thing is big and bulky. Have you seen it on top? Mike, how many feet do you think it is? Five, six feet long? And it's heavy. It's cumbersome would be the word. Had I not heeded the warning of number one warning and stopped to look, I would have had major damage to my vehicle. Had I proceeded like three more feet, that thing would have just ripped up. I don't know what would have happened. It would have been awful. So this little illustration in the natural, if you're contemplating something that you know you need to just not go, take this as your warning. That metal bar that is going to rip the top of my vehicle off, Rip the top of the the box that's connected, that's connected to rails, that's connected to the roof. If there's something in your life that you're contemplating and you know that you've had a warning, I'm reminding you, stop. Do a what? Do a U-turn. I thank the Lord that I wasn't foolish and just thought, oh, I could do it and just proceed. I 
could have continued on. I could have done, oh, I can make it through there. I can do this thing. There was a warning. I didn't have the information when I first got there on what the parameters were. But you guys are learning about God's parameters, God's guidelines, God's restrictions, God's commands. We're all learning. And if you know you should not proceed through that metal bar that's going to just rip, rip that top thing off, you need to cut it off. I had to take it off. Just like I was talking about last week, if there are things in your life that you need to cut off, the things of the flesh, the things in the spiritual realm, don't kiss the former. Don't go back to the old things. Don't go back to the life of sin. Accept the freedom that you have in Christ. So this, again, this was the very beginning of my journey, except, you know, the process of getting there. This was my entrance to the parking to go to the airplane. Had I not listened, my trip would have started much differently. So I'm just, I'm telling you, this day, I don't know who this is for, I'll read it again in Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So God's covenant and instructions to Abraham, he told them to do something and he did it right away. Jesus' words about the vine abiding in him, about loving, the Beatitudes about acknowledging your need for a savior. Fighting not in the flesh, but the spirit. Oh, I have a typo. Sorry, guys. I thought I switched it, but it apparently didn't. Freedom and forgiveness. There's freedom in forgiveness. And new life. Got to be born of the spirit. So I want to pray. If there's anybody here at the sound of my voice that knows the Lord spoke to them about something, about something they've been contemplating doing or not doing. God, I pray that they would take the warning, that they'd stop at the first, at the first crossbar before they go and take that chance of, well, I'm going to read this scripture. It says, just even in anger, you've heard that it was said of them old that, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. God, we don't want to do anything, anything that would compromise our relationship with you. God, I pray this day that promises that you've given us, covenants that we've made with you, vows that we've taken before you, God, that we would remember them. That we would remember that there's life in you. There was more of more instruction that you guys really should go back and read in that Matthew Matthew five. Verily I say unto you, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till you thou hast paid that most farthing. You have heard that it is said in old time time Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whoso looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if then I offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable to thee that one of the members should perish and not the whole body should be cast into hell. And if the right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not the whole body should be cast into hell. 
He hath said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Again, you have heard that it has been said of them by, of old time that thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor of the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is a city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou shalt Thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh evil. There's so much in here, God. There's so much in here, that sermon that you gave before you left. God, I pray that our hearts would listen and obey. God, I pray that each person at the sound of my voice would have heard something to be strengthened and empowered through your scripture. God, I thank you that your word is life. And God, your desire is none, none, that none should perish. We all need you. God, help us to cut off those things. Help us to be mindful of you and your word. God, thank you for strengthening us this day. If there's anybody out there that's never said yes to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. I was talking about being born of the flesh and born of the spirit. Jesus saves. Jesus alone saves. There's different religions, but this religion is about relationship. Christianity, Christ died for us. He gave his life for us. And it says, if you believe in your heart and you confess him as Lord, you'll be saved. And I want you to pray with me. If you want him to be your savior and you want to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit in. So just pray if you want this. Dear Jesus, I thank you for dying for me. I believe that you did die and that you rose again and I want to be in your kingdom. Help me to love like you love. Help me to live like you live. Help me to die to self. Your word says, no greater love hath a man that a man lay down his life for his friends. Help me to be an example to cut off those things that shouldn't be and to allow you to pour into me. Fill me up, God. Fill me up to overflowing. May I be a walking, living vessel for you. God, I want you. Holy Spirit, come in. change and transform me. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to end with this song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Have you decided to follow Jesus? There's a sacrifice in that. Following Jesus, it comes with a cost. You know what he wants from you? Everything. Everything. That's what he wants. I have decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have, I'm going to, I think I have it in the wrong key. I have decided to follow Jesus. I, 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 the key I, I have, have decided, decided, but is that what we have in our notes? To follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. 
No turning back. God, may we decide this day to follow you. Help the things to be cut off that shouldn't be. And God, may the things that should be bring forth life, not just to ourselves, but to those around us. We thank you. We praise you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Have a great week. Anybody out there who wants to come join us, you're welcome to come join us. 3101 Cherry Street in Hope Grand. Blessings.